Well, thank you. And I'm an IHS alum and the F.A. Harper professor through the Mercatus Center. That's, I don't get to say that a lot, so I want to, if I can say it anywhere, I can say it here. Um, <laughs> and so that's a good transition into what I'm going to talk about today, which is uh, the political economy of peace. Of course, the term peace gets thrown around a lot, uh, uh, certainly in the circles that we all run in, uh, but by people in general. Uh, but rarely do uh, people spend time unpacking uh, uh, what peace entails and, and some of the, the main threats to peace. And so I hope, and hope to touch upon some of those today. Uh, and the way I'm going to proceed is in a series of, of five questions all around peace. Uh, and so let me just get started, uh, which is why peace? Why do we care about this? And, and to start, uh, let's go right to uh, the source, uh, uh, which is uh, a, a pamphlet written by uh, Baldy Harper in 1951. Uh, there's two important war-related pamphlets published in 1951, one by Harper, which I'm going to talk about now, one by Leonard Reed, uh, which I'll come back to at the end. Uh, and if you've never looked at these, uh, I highly recommend that you do. They're relatively short, uh, and, and they're really very relevant for today. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, Harper pointed out uh, in, in this pamphlet uh, was that it was increasingly unfashionable uh, for people uh, who considered themselves to be classical liberals uh, to advocate for peace, uh, to uh, be what he calls peacemonger, a uh, peacemonger, uh, and uh, he's concerned about this. He's concerned about this because he sees war and war making as one of the fundamental threats uh, to uh, liberty, peace, and human flourishing. Uh, and so, if I had to kind of summarize uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, or an alternative title, uh, it's why you should be a peacemonger, uh, and hopefully, I can make that case convincingly. Uh, some other kind of peace-related items. I went to your website. Uh, and so uh, history. Uh, Harper set up an institute devoted to research. Of course, this is 1961. Uh, devoted to research and education with the conviction that a greater understanding of human affairs and freedom would foster peace, prosperity, and social harmony. So again, the very foundations of IHS as an institution is to figure out ways to foster peace. And presumably, along with that, to prevent uh, uh, or to understand various mechanisms, activities, and so on that prevent fostering peace. On your website, there's also a list of core classical liberal principles. Uh, one of those is peaceful solutions. Uh, and so uh, the way that, that IHS is an organization, uh, which I think is very consistent with uh, Harper's vision of this organization, uh, was to focus on the role that peace plays, but also the ability of individuals, and this is going to be crucial, individuals, private individuals, to discover various mechanisms and ways to engage in peaceful interactions with other people, whether those are direct interactions or, at a minimum, some kind of overarching agreed belief in live and let live, uh, of tolerance, uh, and so on. Uh, and so uh, that's my motivation. I'm going to return to these, these classical liberal principles, the other ones, later on. So what is peace? So that's why peace is important. What is peace? Well, if you actually look peace up, there's a lot of different definitions. And it's hard to find just one single definition of it. These are just in standard dictionaries. Uh, but here's kind of what I picked out as the main four characteristics. And I think they're, they're pretty good characteristics. Uh, and uh, if you look across definitions, you'll see uh, uh, variations of these themes. Freedom from disturbance. So freedom from, from other people interfering uh, with you or what you are doing and vice versa. You uh, not interfering with other people. Uh, tranquility. All right. So, so being in a state of tranquility, of, of, of peace. Uh, social harmony. Getting along with other people. Uh, again, whether that's through direct interactions or through uh, uh, allowing people to, to pursue uh, their desired ends, their, their, per, their pursuits in life, even if you don't agree with them. Uh, and finally, absence from violence. Uh, that's another kind of key characteristic of, of peace. What are the benefits of peace? Well, to my way of thinking, they're, they're twofold. Uh, again, very much in line with what Harper talked about and what uh, you all talk about as an institution in terms of your history and, and mission and goals. Uh, individual flourishing. The characteristics of peace that I just laid out uh, allow people to become who they want to become. Uh, you have space to, to, to explore the world, uh, to, to pursue those things that interest you. Uh, 
uh, to not pursue those things that don't interest you, and, and so on. Uh, and to the extent that people need space to experiment, to live life, to flourish as individuals, peace is a central feature uh, of that phenomena. Uh, related, but I would argue distinct, at least conceptually, is prosperity, uh, which is that uh, you know, for all the ink spilt on economic development and what economic development entails, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, people need the freedom to experiment, to innovate, and to interact with other people through exchange, uh, through peaceful exchange. Uh, that is through uh, increases in the extent of the market uh, via voluntary association, uh, which allow people to take advantage uh, not just of the innovation and experimentation of others, but also specialization, the division of labor, and so on. Uh, these ingredients are at the foundation of uh, prosperity and all that is associated with it. So peace is a good thing. It's a good thing to the extent you care about uh, your fellow human beings living uh, fulfilling lives and uh, uh, in terms of improving standards of living uh, such that uh, people are able uh, to uh, avoid uh, uh, living in squalor and all that's associated with it. So what are the foundations of peace? Well, the foundations of peace uh, are, are multiple, but I'm going to highlight these. All right, these are what I think are the, uh, the, the key or, or salient features of what the foundations of peace entail. Uh, a shared set of meta-beliefs uh, about peace and others. What does this mean? As I mentioned earlier, it means having a shared set of beliefs about what peace entails and about other people. What I mean by that is, unless you respect other people and they respect you, uh, uh, there's going to be uh, a, a high likelihood of, of conflict, uh, a, a lack of harmony, and so on. Uh, again, this doesn't require some kind of detailed uh, 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 ethic. Uh, at a minimum, uh, it, it's, it's uh, what we learn uh, as kids, or most of us learn as kids in the sandbox. Uh, don't hit people and don't take their stuff. Uh, and, and let them do their thing. Uh, if they don't want to play with you in the sandbox, uh, then you go to your corner of the sandbox. Uh, but if you want to play with them then you're, and they want to play with you, then you're free to do so. Uh, that, that basic ethic uh, goes a long way, uh, if you think about it, in explaining much of the foundations of a, of a peaceful society. What else? Uh, rules governing interactions between people. In order to have social harmony, uh, association, and so on, you have to have rules that govern those interactions. You also have to have various mechanisms for dissol uh, d resolving disputes. Uh, disputes are unavoidable in life. Uh, even peop people that live peacefully are going to have moments of conflict. Uh, anyone that uh, has interacted with another person or lives with someone uh, knows this quite well. Uh, so you need resolution uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, in principle, these rules and mechanisms can be formal. Uh, that is, they can be written down or codified. The source of those codified rules uh, can be some kind of government, uh, but they also can be codified, written down uh, by people uh, outside the government as well. Uh, or they can be informal. They can be sh shared sets of norms. Uh, and many people have these in their daily lives. They have various uh, informal norms for uh, either avoiding or resolving situations of conflict and dispute such that they are able to take full advantage of the benefits of peaceful interaction. So what are the threats to peace? Well, I want to say that they're pretty straightforward. Things that disturb that list of characteristics. And the main one is violence and warfare. Violence and warfare is the most significant threat to peace. It is the most significant threat to social harmony. Now, what is the typical solution that most people, both throughout history and in the present, offer in order to get this? The, some notion of the state. So if you start from some idea of, of, a, of a Hobbesian jungle, where we're where, where in a situation where life is, is nasty and brutish, uh, the typical solution is we have some kind of referee, some kind of exogenous force come in that we give Leviathan, that we give power to in order to enforce order and harmony on people. And of course, that's one possibility. But one of the things I want to stress today is it by no means the only possibility. And we should question that possibility. The reason we should quest that po question that possibility is because while it's possible for the state to uh, uh, create peace and enforce peace, uh, the state, it, by its very existence, is the greatest uh, threat to that very peace uh, in the history of mankind. Uh, and the reason is very straightforward. To this, for the same reason that you might think that individuals are a threat in terms of their, uh, p the potential of those individuals to engage in violence against you, uh, those same tendencies exist in the state, which are populated by individuals, uh, but they are, are magnified uh, by multitudes. Uh, 
Uh, and so take your worst case scenario between individuals uh, and ramp it up uh, uh, by magnitudes, uh, and that's what the state is, uh, or at least the potential for the state to be. Uh, of course, this idea uh, of the state as a great threat to liberty is not new or novel to me, and it's not new or novel to Harper either, uh, to Baldy Harper. Uh, I think Madison got it right uh, in this quote that I know a lot of people roll out, but I think it's a powerful one because it captures the salient features of what I'm trying to get you to think about. And Madison's point is very straightforward. Uh, war is the most significant, or the war-making abilities, I should say. It's not just engaging in war. The war-making abilities of the state are the greatest threat to liberty. Why? Well, as Madison says, they're a threat on, on mundane margins, on the ordinary operating margins of the state. So war-making is correlated with taxation and the introduction of new taxes. It is uh, 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 correlated uh, uh, with uh, needing both weapons and uh, uh, human capital in order to utilize those weapons. So uh, of, of increases in uh, ar the army apparatus, uh, of the issuance of debt uh, and other tools of public finances and so on. Uh, and as uh, Madison points out correctly uh, to my way of thinking, uh, these are tools to bring people under the state's domination. But there's something else that Madison points out beyond the, the, the mundane, ordinary operations of the state, the, the public finance and expenditure side, which is war and war making uh, increases the scope of the state uh, and state power. Uh, that is, uh, it expands the discretionary power uh, of the state operations. Uh, uh, Madison highlights the executive, uh, but he stops too soon. Uh, it expands the power uh, of uh, all levels uh, of the state, uh, the centralized state, uh, because war making requires an extremely strong centralized state. Uh, and when I say it, it, he stops too soon, it expands the power uh, of bureaucracies. Uh, it undermines uh, systems of checks and balances. Uh, that is one, at least in America, uh, one of the correlates of wars, the erosion of federalist checks and balances as the lower level governments become subservient to uh, uh, its central master uh, because of course states, uh, uh, counties and so on don't carry out uh, American foreign policy. Uh, the national government does. And as the natural, national government gains more power, uh, what happens is uh, the uh, political units that are on the periphery, uh, which are meant to check uh, uh, the centralized state, uh, lose power. Uh, and so uh, you have increases in both the, the scale and the scope of the state. Tocqueville, Tocqueville and Democracy in America points out war making as the greatest threat to democracy. Now why? He says, look, it's not that if you start a war, the system's just going to collapse and you're going to move towards what he called hard despotism or authoritarianism. That's possible, by the way, but that's not the real concern. The real concern, in Tocqueville's estimation, is that war making does what? Well, as he points out, it changes the relationship between the citizenry and the state, the centralized state. It changes the habits, the mindsets, the way that citizens perceive the state. And the state gains more power over the lives of citizens. As that happens, it erodes necessarily the power that is possessed by individuals. I'm going to come back to this later on again. But what both of these authors are highlighting, and there's many others as well that I could draw upon, but what they're highlighting is that war making is a grave threat to liberty because it changes the social fabric of society. It is not something that can be neatly compartmentalized. It is not something that can be start, you can just start and stop as you want. And it's not something that you can simply do war making stuff and then undo it. Once you've done it, you can't get the toothpaste back in the tube, or at least not all the toothpaste. And that's the issue. That's the issue we need to wrestle with, to think about. Notice the connection here. <clears throat> to the extent you think that Madison and Tocqueville are onto something, you see how the war-making powers of the state are a grave threat to liberty and freedom. Again, in principle, if used correctly, they can produce liberal outcomes. They can, they can uh, uh, enhance peace. Uh, but at the same time, that is no foregone conclusion. Uh, and of course, we don't need to rely on political theory to point that out. Uh, all we need is a, a history book or two. Uh, and you look at the empirical records of the, of the state, uh, and they have been the tools of conquest. 
Uh, uh, that's what the, the, the state has been historically. <clears throat> so here's the standard model. Here's certainly how most economists, but I would submit most social scientists and most people who think about these things at all, implicitly or explicitly tend to think about the relationship between the state, the state's war making powers, and liberal outcomes or peace and order. And it's a very linear way of thinking about it. You have the fiscal brain. The fiscal brain is an idea that comes from James Buchanan. James Buchanan wrote a paper in 1949 called The Pure Theory of Public Finance. And in that paper, he said, look, he was talking to his fellow public economists. And he said, the way that most economists model the state when they're talking about public economics, the things the state does, is what he called the fiscal brain. The fiscal brain for Buchanan is a supercomputer. All right, it's the equivalent of a supercomputer. It has access to a social welfare function. A social welfare function is, a, is in principle, a, a, a apparatus that allows you to gauge the activities that will maximize the welfare of society as a whole. And what it does is benevolently raises tax revenue, or not just tax revenue, it raises revenue using some mix of, of debt, taxation, and, and printing money, and then spits out various state activities which maximize social welfare. All right? And that's possible, of course, but what Buchanan was urging his fellow economists to think about is unpacking that fiscal brain. Because in reality, decisions are not made by a benevolent, super moral computer. They're made by human beings, imperfect human beings, who populate a set of institutions that we call the state or government. Now with defense, I would submit, it gets even worse because you have the fiscal brain, but then you also have the defense brain. What's the defense brain? The defense brain is the view that there is something called the national security state, the military, that somehow protects the national interest, that is doing things to protect us, and that's all they do. We need the state to protect us in order to get peace and order. Arguing to the contrary is viewed somehow as radical, is viewed as crazy. So what do you get? Well, in this model, you get the fiscal brain, so they raise the optimal revenue. They give the optimal amount to the national security state. Then they give the optimal amount to education, to health, to everything else the state does, to its entire portfolio of activities. Then the defense brain takes those resources and only engages in those actions which generate peace and order, which generate liberal outcomes, which improve the welfare of you and I and all other citizens. That's the, the status quo. That's the, the, the operating uh, uh, apparatus that most people ha have in the back of their head. <clears throat> Even when they talk about deviations from this model, by the way, they still have in the back of their head. And I'll come back to that later on. So here's the issue with this, I would suggest. The issue is that arguments for the state as a requirement for peace assume, typically implicitly, that the state and the political process and all that's involved is going to do what you want it to do. They're going to do what you think they should do to maximize public interest. You hear this right now. So right now, there's a, a supposed peace agreement between the US government and the Taliban, which has been broken already this morning. Right before I left, I read the Taliban started attacking people, which again, anyone uh, with a modicum of common sense uh, uh, is not surprised by this whatsoever. But it's just political cover to remove some troops anyway. That's what it is. But listen to people talk about it. No one says, like, why do we have a military doing this in the first place? What do they say? If they had, the, the, the invasion of Afghanistan was justified, but if only they had done X, it would have worked out. If only they had, uh, the proponents of Obama will say, if only they had followed the surge, it would have worked out. Others say, uh, if only they had left at this time, it would have worked out. That's this. You are assuming that the state's going to do what you want it to do, and that somehow you have insight into what it should do. No one seems to say, well, wait a second. The state never does what I want it to do. Uh, and it doesn't do what other people want it to do. Uh, something's amiss here uh, in, in the framework that we're thinking about. Uh, and so uh, what do we want to do, or what do I suggest that we want to do? Uh, what I want to suggest is as students of a, a free society, students and, 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 and people that share a concern for precisely the things uh, that are mentioned on your website, peace and order, that we can't take this as the fundamental model. We need to unpack 
those two boxes, the fiscal brain and the defense brain. So now the question is, how are we going to do that? How are we going to break open those boxes? Well, what I want to suggest to you is that we have a toolbox available to us to do so. And that involves the following tools or categories of tools. Uh, uh, one is Austrian economics. Think about this. Uh, F.A. Hayek uh, in, 19, in the 1940s wrote a book called The Fatal Conceit, The Errors of Socialism. All right, what was the fatal conceit for Hayek? The fatal conceit was the view that human beings can design the world according to their desires. Now, he was talking about economic planning. I would submit that war making, foreign intervention, imperialism broadly construed uh, is, is the fatal conceit writ large. Uh, because not only do proponents of this position believe that they can plan economic activity, but that they can plan all the other activities that constitute uh, a humankind. Uh, th un think through what the term nation building means uh, and actually unpack that and think through what the knowledge requirements would be to actually be successful in that. And of course, the fatal conceit of foreign intervention or of war making relies on the same exact means, the same exact tools and methods that central planning of economic activity did. Just expanding the portfolio, saying why stop at economic activity, let's go all in. Let's plan everything. That seems to offer us that same set of critiques that Hayek, Mises before him, and so on, those that followed Don Lavoie, offered in critiquing efforts to centrally plan society seem highly applicable to efforts to plan the world. Now notice, it's not even that you need to plan the world, because you say, OK, we won't engage in nation building. The very apparatus of the military is an exercise in central planning writ large. It is an exercise in cronyism. It is an exercise in, in a, a, a economic setup uh, that mimics what the fascists tried to do, uh, which is a set of private public partnerships that are governed through bureaucratic rules. It's not the abolition of private property rights over the means of production. Those are still owned by private people. Uh, it's that there is a set of political entanglements between private firms and the public apparatus that we call the national security state, again, with the desired outcome of maximizing social welfare. So certainly there's something to offer there. Then we have constitutional political economy. What's the central issue in, par uh, of constitu in constitutional political economy? Madison's point, what we call the paradox of government. Uh, uh, that is, any power you give to government to protect you uh, can be turned around and used against you. Now, people often talk about this in terms of taxation and whatnot, uh, but when it comes to the military, we have more stark uh, uh, examples. Uh, that is, you give the government a gun, they can turn around and point it at you. You give them a drone, they can turn around and uh, fly it over you silently. You give them the most powerful surveillance apparatus uh, in the history of mankind, uh, they can surveil you. Uh, and so uh, what you need to think about is what set of assumptions would be required in order for them to use these awesome powers only for good, which then leads us directly into public choice economics, which is the application of the economic way of thinking to a variety of non-market situations, including politics. And so we have our theories of bureaucracy. We have our theories of how voters act in democracies, how elected officials act, and so on. Why is this important? Because once you start to unpack the black box on both the fiscal side and the defense side, the same way we would for any other area of policy we would study, very quickly you start to, re you start to uh, uh, realize uh, that the uh, national security state uh, is uh, infected by a variety of pathologies. Uh, a variety of pathologies uh, which makes it highly unlikely uh, that they are doing anything uh, to promote the national or public interest. Uh, uh, again, uh, if you think this is, is too strong in rhetoric, uh, pick your pet area, uh, whether it's education, healthcare, whatever your pet policy area is. Uh, uh, the DMV, let's say you hate going to the DMV, right? You say it's a long line, or Amtrak, or the Metro right here in DC. Man, they're really bad at running the Metro. All right, now imagine scaling up the Metro and giving it nuclear weapons. <laughs> it's the same industrial organization. It's the same structure. It's just magnified on a greater scale. Under what set of conditions do the same problems that plague ordinary politics domestically go away when we scale it up internationally? If anything, we should expect those same issues to be much greater. And we have good arguments for that. 
Finally, power and class analysis. You say, wait a second, that sounds like Marx. What are we doing here? Well, Marx gets too much credit for this. We gotta take it back, take the power back. Uh, there's Albert J. Nock. Uh, there's Franz, on, uh, Franz Oppenheimer, the state. Then you say, well, wait, they're after Marx. Well, wait a second, what about the French liberals? So we're talking late 1700s into the 1800s, right? Charles Comte, Charles uh, Dumoir. What were these folks pointing out? Uh, that there's certainly power and class structures in society. Uh, here's the way that they thought about it. Uh, there uh, is what uh, Albert J. Nock uh, talked about as the distinction uh, between political power and social power. Uh, political power constitutes all that uh, in the realm of violence, force, or, or thereof, uh, or the threat thereof, I should say. Social power uh, entails voluntary cooperation between consenting individuals. These things are at odds with one another. Uh, that is when the political apparatus seizes additional political power, uh, that is going to come at the expense uh, of uh, the social power that is possessed by individuals. Notice this is very much in line with the way Tocqueville was thinking as well. In terms of when the state gets more power, what does it do? Removes the power from individuals. In addition to changing their habits and beliefs. We don't exercise the muscles of private association, of private problem solving, of creativity anymore, because we simply outsource it. So we outsource it to other people to solve our problems for us. And we give them awesome powers in the name of doing so. So you combine this together. You combine the insights of epistemic or knowledge problems with centrally planning a world that is defined by numerous overlapping complex systems. That's the high point among others. Then you combine that with the core insights or concern with public choice analysis. Then you realize what the issue is when it comes to constitutions, which is it's not just that states pose a threat to us, a possibility. It's that there are real dynamics at work which makes that threat highly likely in reality. Uh, that is during times of war and war making. Uh, what happens is that constitutions and constitutional rules fall under severe uh, 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 stress. At the exact moment when they're supposed to be most biting, when they're supposed to limit abuses of power, they're typically pushed by the wayside. Checks and balances are pushed by the wayside. Courts, at least in America, typically defer to the executive branch. Uh, uh, Congress gave up uh, any responsibilities that it pretended to have about declaring war making long ago. Uh, so we don't even have to uh, worry about that anymore. Uh, that's gone, uh, if it ever existed at all in any kind of real incredible manner. Uh, and so what happens? Uh, power becomes centralized. Uh, uh, constitutional constraints go by the wayside because we're supposedly in, in extraordinary times. We're not in normal times. And so what's the result? More political power, less social power. So let me return to our list of classical liberal principles that I took right from your website. I think there's 14 of them, including peaceful solutions. And let's think about those in terms of war making. <clears throat> Human dignity and individual freedom. Well, when it comes to war making or engaging in war, Human dignity and indiv individual freedom domestically are replaced. What are they replaced by? Collectivism. I can't think of a more collectivist activity outside of mass force state collectivism than war making. Uh, we all must be unified uh, around the goals of the government, for the people, for the nation. Uh, this is collectivism writ large. Uh, you have to fall in line. Doing so uh, is considered unpatriotic. <clears throat> what else happens? Uh, well, internationally, the plans of interveners, the people that sit down and write out the blueprint for how the world should look, uh, replace the plans, the desires, the dignity of individuals in other society who are lumped together in a homogenous group, some outgroup. We need to fight them over there. Uh, I can't think of a better example of, of collectivism and, and, and the the antithesis of, of, of individual freedom and human dignity and simply lumping together an entire population of people based on uh, imaginary borders and then making broad claims about them and then imposing a set of views and values and plans 
on them at the threat of gunpoint. And those plans are designed by outsiders who supposedly know what is good for the world, not just for their own nation, but for the world. Because notice, people purport, they go beyond even saying that the American government is working in the national interest. They're working in the global interest. They're literally bringing freedom to the world. That's a, that's a tall order to fulfill. <clears throat> Voluntary action, uh, both domestically and internationally, is replaced by centralized control. As I mentioned earlier, uh, war making and war making powers, the state, the national security apparatus, you would be hard pressed to find a larger uh, public private bureaucratic uh, hodgepodge uh, than this industry, than this sector. Uh, yet people magically, people by the way, who are otherwise highly skeptical of bureaucracies engaging in either, government bureaucracies engaging in the, even the most basic of domestic tasks, somehow confer magical powers upon it when they talk about foreign intervention because we need the state to protect us and bring us order. So it's one of two things. Either the state is dysfunctional when it comes to its domestic activities, when it comes to things like providing us health care, providing us education, controlling the economy, or it's not. Which one is it? And if it's good in one way in one area, why isn't it good in the other? If we say, look, government's terrible domestically at, at, at education, but I think they can go abroad and establish a whole education system, uh, either there's an inconsistency or it's just a matter of management techniques. Uh, that is that the problem domestically is not the existence of the state and its various dysfunctions, but that the military management style has not been properly implemented domestically. So our solution should not be to seek alternatives to the state provision of education, but rather to import the military management style, given the, how effectively it supposedly works internationally, and so on down the line. Again, this voluntary action, the way it manifests itself, or, or I should say the, the erosion of voluntary action, uh, varies greatly from context to context. During the World Wars, it was some mix of conscription, it was price controls, it was rationing, and so on. Even in times of now, uh, our government is involved in warfare against us. Uh, in the form of the various trade barriers it puts in place. Uh, those trade barriers, uh, which preclude individuals in one society from voluntarily interacting with individuals in another society, again, based on the borders within which they happen to be born, is a form of warfare. It's a form of warfare and violence because go back to what we talked about as the foundations of peace, social harmony. That is, if you and I are going to interact with each other peacefully and someone comes between us and says you are no longer to, to allowed to interact with that person, and then they, and you say, well, uh, no thank you, I don't uh, appreciate the advice, I'll still interact with the person, uh, and then they threaten to fine you, uh, uh, throw you in a cage, or kill you, uh, uh, there's a problem there. Uh, we don't have social harmony anymore. Now take that logic and extend it internationally. That logic does not change because someone's skin color changes, because someone's nationality, ethnicity, gender, religion, and so on changes. It is still violent interference into, uh, uh, into voluntary action. By the way, uh, a, a group of people not far from here in Washington, D.C. are very comfortable embracing this language. It's called war by other means. They make the argument that the U.S. government should certainly ramp up the military aspect, but then, then neglecting this whole other portfolio of activities. And they say, we should engage in geoeconomic control. That's a fancy way of saying manipulate economics to get economic, uh, typically highly aggregate uh, economic outcomes and measures to get other people and other societies to do what we want to do. Energy policy, sanctions, foreign, poli uh, foreign aid, uh, and so on down the line. The argument goes that uh, those in Washington, D.C can uh, effectively and efficiently use these tools to engage in warfare by other means. That's a form of warfare. That is a, a, a reduction in voluntary action, which uh, reduces social harmony. Justice and the rule of law. F.A. Hayek, third volume of Law, Legislation, and Liberty, has a section talking about principle and expediency. And he says, look, here's the really hard part about maintaining a free society. It's based on principle. It's based on the principle of constraints, very hard constraints on government and freedom of association. And then we, what do we say? Well, that's gonna to lead to good stuff, right? And he says, what are, the, what are the proponents of expediency, meaning give them power to do stuff? What do they get to say? 
They get to say, if you give me more power, if you give up some of your freedom, I will give you X, Y, and Z. So why is that hard? Because the proponents of principle are left saying this. If you let people live their lives, if you leave people up to their own devices, good stuff will tend to happen. And they say, well, what stuff? I say, I don't know. That's why I want freedom. Because I want to allow people to have the ability to discover those things, to figure them out. In most cases, that's a hard sell compared to if you give me, give up your freedom, I'll make you safer. I'll give you X, Y, and Z. That's a hard case to make, but one that is necessary for a free society, according to Hayek. And I think that's correct. So what happens during wartime? Constraints are thrown off government. Rule of law goes out the window. Justice goes out the window. Why? Because the state cannot be constrained in protecting, uh, cannot be constrained in its protection of people or to do things that it purports to be protecting people. So what do they say? These are extraordinary times. So I should be able to do what I want, right? We torture people. No, we don't. Why not? I, re I wrote a memo that defined torture to say I'm not torturing people, <laughs> right? So the Geneva Conventions don't apply to me. Well, wait. If you can do that, if you can simply write down words on a piece of paper to redefine terms, then there's no constraints at all other than the time spent writing the words down. And down the line, down the line, if you go throughout the history of, of any constitutional, constitutionally constrained government and look at wartime, it is the time uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, constraints are thrown off. Uh, you don't even have to go to wartime, by the way. The very operation of the national security state is at odds with the rule of law. You know, there's a, there's a very mundane rule that was passed in the early 1990s. It passes the smell test as a pretty good rule, uh, which is that uh, all the major federal bureaucracies need to pass an audit. Uh, the same way you or I would need to do. You know, look, if you and I ran a business and uh, we didn't pay our taxes or the IRS came and said, uh, show us your books, and we said, no, no thanks, uh, uh, you'd either get a fine, you get shut down, or thrown in jail. Uh, there's one organization that doesn't happen to. That's called the, the Pentagon. Uh, and so they passed a law in the 90s that you need to pass an audit. This is law, all right? Uh, there's uh, one organization that only started getting audited two years ago, and that's the Pentagon. Uh, so they were in violation of federal law, and this is just one of them, uh, for a significant period of time. Uh, that is, to the extent you believe in the rule of law, uh, this should trouble you greatly. Uh, again, if, 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 if our supposed representatives not far from here also cared about these things, it should trouble them greatly. Uh, well, certainly the budgets that have been received by the Pentagon uh, don't indicate any kind of worry uh, about these things. Uh, uh, people don't worry about them all, at all. Uh, and of course, for those of you who don't know, they, the Pentagon's went through their second audit. They failed both of them because they can't keep track of any of the money. And they're like, yeah, we expected to fail them, but at least we're doing it now. That's the accomplishment. Like we're actually following the law. All right? And that's just one example. Now again, imagine that writ large across everything the national security state does. Do you think that the, the magnitude of those issues is greater or smaller? And so rule of law is out the window. It's gone. We don't worry about that. We can't be constrained. We can't be bothered by laws during wartime. Toleration and pluralism. What happens? During wartime, as I mentioned earlier, you get unification. Nationalism. The, na the nation needs to rally together. Why aren't you wearing your yellow ribbon? Why aren't you uh, uh, thanking every soldier that you see? What, what, are you not a good patriot? Uh, how dare you question whether the military should be abroad or not? Uh, don't you care about the troops? Uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, naive uh, nationalism uh, that, that, that uh, springs out of war making. Uh, and of course, the state invests a significant amount of resources from the time uh, you are young uh, from, from creating this culture. Uh, and it's just perpetuated uh, throughout uh, adulthood as well. Uh, what else happens? A regimentation. We all need to make sacrifices. Fall in line. Don't complain at the airport because you just sacrifice a little bit of your time for freedom and to protect people. So fall in line and don't question it. And if you do question it, uh, somehow you're a bad citizen. Uh, xenophobia, again, they're simple in-groups, out-groups. Uh, if you, again, think I'm exaggerating this, uh, go Google uh, the propaganda put forward by the US government during World War II. Uh, and look at how they talked about Germans uh, and, Japan and the Japanese, all right? Uh, and what were they trying to do? You homogenize your enemy and you dehumanize them and you lump them all together. It's us versus them. Uh, what else? Uh, typically blatant discrimination. 
Perhaps the best example of this are the internment of Japanese Americans, uh, which, by the way, was upheld as constitutional by the Supreme Court. So it could happen again. People are like, that could never happen again. Certainly it could. Certainly it could. Uh, and it would be fully legal to do it, actually. You wouldn't need to break the law in that case. Freedom of expression. What happens to freedom of expression during war? You can't say that. Uh, uh, you can't speak out. Uh, people are surveilled. People are controlled. Uh, if you think I'm exaggerating this or unfamiliar, go look at the U.S. governments, the CIA, the FBI, uh, uh, the NSA, uh, or, or earlier iterations of the NSA uh, uh, during wars. All right? Go look during the Vietnam War, uh, uh, the, the various activities uh, that were taken by the U.S. government to infiltrate, to control, to manipulate the anti-war and civil rights movements in the name of what? Uh, the threat of communism. Right? So again, when there's a threat to state power, what happens? The, the state's supposed to be protecting us, but when there's a threat to their power, that is people don't like what they're doing, people that are, they're supposed to be representing, they need to infiltrate and control those people. That is the tools of the state apparatus that are supposedly protecting us are directed against the citizens in the name of protecting the citizens. Again, something doesn't comport with the logic here. Something's amiss. Civil society, at best it's pushed by the wayside in deference to the state and all that the state does uh, uh, to protect us. Uh, and at worst, it's directly uh, thwarted, as I just mentioned. Civil society is voluntary people coming together to uh, pursue some kind of end. Spontaneous order and intellectual humility go right out the window. What happens with spontaneous order? Spontaneous order is order that is the result of, a, of purposive human action but not human design. It is not controlled or shaped by definition. That's the defining feature of it, going back to the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, uh, up through, of course, Hayek, who emphasized this throughout his body of research and so on. What is foreign intervention and war making other than planning writ large, as I mentioned earlier? All aspects of it from economic activity. By the way, for those unfamiliar, during the great debates in the uh, 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 early uh, 1900s about socialism versus capitalism, all right, the, the, the calculation debate with Mises and Hayek. At the foundation of many of the socialist model was the war economy. Otto Neuroth, who was a, a, a fellow student of Mises at, at Vienna in von Bavrik's seminar, ha had an article where he talked about the move from the war economy to the peace economy. He said, look, the war economy works great. You have central planning, they redirect resources, and they get more bombs, more tanks. Let's just take that and apply it to everything. We'll have full employment. We'll have no business cycles, and we'll get lots of stuff. We'll remove the chaos and anarchy of the market because no one is controlling that. We'll just control the entire economic system as if it's a large firm. That was the argument. Why did he make that argument? Because what is the nature of war planning other than central planning writ large, both within institutions and over institutions? The very idea of a liberal order in the world that is designed is this. That is that there's no spontaneous order, or that spontaneous order is insufficient, or that a designed order is superior to that. You might believe that, but if you believe that, follow it through with logical conclusion, which is you need to give up most of the arguments that we have for spontaneous order, except at the smallest possible scale. Because presumably, if you can design, if a group of well-enlightened and well-resourced individuals can design an, a, a liberal order internationally, certainly they can design one domestically. That's a much easier task. One nation state versus all the nation states. Uh, intellectual humility. Uh, you'll be hard pressed to find any intellectual humility at all uh, when it comes to the national security state. Uh, the very its very operation requires people to believe or act as if they believe they can literally control the world. They can control the world and all that uh, falls under its purview. That is at the very foundation of the system. From top to bottom, uh, economic freedom. Uh, Don Lavoie, in the last chapter of National Economic Planning, What is Left? If you haven't read it, Mercatus republished it several years ago. It was originally published in 1985. He talks about how planning is the militarization of the economy. The reason is the militarization of the economy is because it takes the regimentation, coercion, planning of planning, and applies it to economic, act of military operations, excuse me, and applies it to economic activity. It has to. Why? 
in order to get intervention of any sort, you have to do things differently or want things differently than what would have happened. Or there'd be no urge to intervene in the first place. If people are doing what you wanted them to do, you wouldn't have an urge to intervene. An intervener intervenes because they say, I don't like what you're doing, and you should be doing X. That goes for price controls. That goes for economic interventions, within an, all economic interventions, both domestically and internationally. It goes for interventions in life in general. I don't like who you're interacting with. I don't like who's running that country. I don't like their policies, and so on down the list. That requires a military mindset. So when it comes to economic freedom, which requires what? Well, property rights, but the ability to trade with who you want to trade with, to go into those areas of work you want to go into, uh, 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 to be employed in, and so on. You need to have those, that ability. What does war making do? undermines those things. It undermines those things by bringing under the purview of the state control over economic activity. And finally, peaceful solutions. War is the, at very odds with peace. <clears throat> so the other thing I want to uh, mention is one response to what I'm saying is, OK, there's costs, but there's good stuff. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But also, it's just during wartime. There's starts and there ends, except there's not. One of the myths of discussions of war is the term wartime, that there is a, a, a start and a finish. Now, you might say, no, there's a declaration of war and a surrender, or the withdrawal of troops, or George Bush standing under the mission accomplished sign. That's clearly the end. But it never ends like that. It never ends like that. Whether it's the manpower that remains on the ground, whether it's the interference in the economic system, in the political and social system of other societies, but let's pretend that all gets pulled back. You still can't just do one thing. Why? Because go back to Madison and Tocqueville. Government interventions of which war making, preparation for war and engaging in war, is a, a significant set of interventions, can never just do one thing. They have long-term consequences. This is one of the insights of, again, thinkers like Mises, Hayek. They talked about things like manipulating prices, how it has a long-term chain of consequences that affects the entire structure of production in the economy. Take that logic and apply it to society as a whole. So what's an example? Espionage Act, 1917. So that's a good thing. You've got to squash dissent during war. Then it sits there on the books. Which president employed the Espionage Act the most? President Obama against members of the media, leakers, and so on. There was no way in 1917, well, there's not that there's no way. It's highly unlikely that the people that, that authored this law in 1917 could have ever foreseen the consequences under which it was deployed decades later. But it sat on the books. It sat there and was utilized in an opportunistic manner by someone in future periods, in the name, of course, of protecting society, of protecting the nation. And so you have real effects anytime you engage in war. You have long and variable effects, which cannot be easily seen and observed. But remember, Bastiat, Henry Hazlitt, what do they say? The art of economics, as Hazlitt puts it, is not just focusing on the observable costs of things, but on the chain of consequences that emerges from some action. And one of the things that economics and political economy illuminates for us in the realm of war making is that the chain of consequences is long and variable and is unknown precisely because you, a, a, a group of planners is intervening in a, a, a set of overlapping complex systems which cannot be grasped through human reason. So here's my alternative model, the way we should think about it. Real world politics and all that's involved in it. All right, think about uh, 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 the way politics operates domestically. That's on the revenue side. Think about the, the way the, the warfare state operates and everything involved in it, bureaucracies, domestic and international special interests, elected officials who are trying to get elected, rationally ignorant voters, and so on down the line. There's interplay between these things. Of course, the standard model assumes a very, very linear compartmentalized Movement, you get money, it goes to security in the national security state outcomes. Well, what happens? The real world warfare state is not some passive actor. Uh, the, the various individuals that constitute the warfare state engage in significant activities to influence the political process to benefit them. Uh, all of the checks and balances of which uh, there are some, but they are typically weak, are, are the weakness is magnified under uh, uh, national security. Think about one thing, one example, congressional oversight. You say, well, congressional, Congress, congressional oversight committees will keep check of the national security state, except there's a problem, uh, which is you have massive classification of information, and the source of the information 
that is used by members of Congress to oversee the Bureau is provided by the Bureau. What do you think happens under that scenario? One set of arguments would be, well, of course, they only care about protecting us, so they're gonna provide the right information, including all the bad stuff, to the members of Congress so they can check us appropriately. An alternative is they will not. I would submit that the latter is more accurate, but I'll leave it up to you to make your own determination of that. So there's an interplay between these things. You get some set of revenue, that's passed on to the warfare state, then you get the warfare state. What's the warfare state? That's everything. That is the complex uh, set of entanglements between private firms uh, and, and uh, uh, members of Congress and uh, uh, bureaucracies that constitute the warfare state. That's the NSA. Uh, that's the nuclear program in the Department of Energy. Uh, that's the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and so on and so forth. Walk through all the interests uh, uh, that, that are at work there, uh, and then uh, think about what the outcomes are. What I want to submit, after going through that list I just went through with you, that our default position should be that this process is going to generate illiberal outcomes. This is fundamentally at odds with the standard view, which is somehow this process generates always and everywhere liberal outcomes. Notice this doesn't preclude the possibility of liberal outcomes happening. No more than the state doing anything generating liberal outcomes, can generate some liberal outcomes. It's that our default position, based on the tools that I only briefly touched upon, lead me to conclude that our position should be one of default illiberal outcomes. <clears throat> so why does this matter? Let me sum up here. The reason this matters uh, is because it has real effects on the things we care about, the very foundations of a free society, the things that are outlined on the IHS website that Baldy Harper envisioned when he started this organization, the things that motivated him. So I have two forms of my conclusion. The weak form, what I call the weak form and the strong form. Here's the weak form. The weak form is that you should have a very strong default presumption against all things war, imperialism, and militarism. Uh, I mentioned that in 1951 there was two important war pamphlets, one being uh, Harper, the other being Reed. Uh, Reed, of course, remember, was the founder and president of FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education, where Harper worked until uh, 1958, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly. And he goes to Volcker and then starts IHS in 1961. But just like for Harper, Reed was concerned that war was the greatest enemy. And that's not supposed to be hyperbole. There's arguments behind that for the reasons I, I walked through, going back to Madison, Tocqueville, and thinkers even before them. The greatest enemy of economic progress, of peace. So one of the things that frustrates me is the precautionary principle. Now, the precautionary principle is a principle that goes something like this. Where there is some activity that might call, cause uh, irreparable harm, and in the face of strong scientific evidence and consensus to the contrary, uh, that means that it's not going to cause harm. That activity should be avoided, uh, if not heavily regulated. All right. Now look, folks at Mercatus combat this all the time. Right? Adam Thier, what does he do? He's arguing for permissionless innovation in the face of what? The use of the precautionary principle, which is that you know, artificial intelligence might be so bad that we need government to regulate it. Right? You'll hear this in the, in the face of uh, environmental policy. Why do we grant the precautionary principle to policymakers? I want to take it back. And here's how I want to take it back. I want to apply the precautionary principle to government and to the operation of the war state. And when you do that, I would submit you reach the conclusion uh, that, the war, that war making uh, powers of the state uh, should be severely curtailed at best. Uh, if not altogether removed, precisely because the harms, potential harms associated with it are enormous, enormous. We're not just talking here with loss of economic resources and loss of civil liberties. We're also talking death and maiming of people, millions of people. There is only one apparatus that has the scale of power to do that, only one. And that's the centralized state with all the supposed war innovations at its disposal. So why do we apply the precautionary principle to more mundane things of ordinary life when we don't apply it to the actual people who are supposedly carrying out the implementation of the precautionary principle? I would submit that's a great failure on our part. My strong form is that the state poses the greatest threat 
to peace, to the very thing where we started. And therefore, the only solution is to remove the root cause. We already have rules on the books, not followed. You can say, please follow them. They won't follow them. Mundane things, please follow rules about keeping track of money. No. OK, thank you for trying. Here's more money for a bigger budget. Please don't intervene and get bogged down in foreign interventions for decades. OK, and then they do it. And then we applaud them when they come up with an agreement to leave. Wow, that's such a great thing. Oh, by the way, many people don't think it's a great thing. They want to expand it even more. In the face of blatant failures, by, not by my justification, by the justification of the end stated by the proponents of the intervention in the first place. So what point do you say, you have no evidence on your side? And they say, no, we have some evidence. And they start pointing back to World War II. And you say, look, what have you done lately? And on top of that, systematically, what gives you confidence that things are going to be different systematically across cases in the future, not in one-off cases? Because the problem is, I'm going to spend a few more moments talking about this before I open it up for, for Q&A. Here's some responses that people give me when I talk about this stuff. What about, and then po point to some historical case of success, right? And, or Hitler often comes up, of course. That's a stopping argument when you bring up Hitler, right? That's the, the end of the argument, or so I'm told. Think about this in everything else that we talk about in life. If someone said to you, you're pointing out that private people can do better with education. Oh, yeah? I live in Fairfax, Virginia. We have some of the best public schools there are. We'd say that's not the argument. The argument is not that you can just, that, that if you spend enough money and do enough stuff that every once in a while you'll get good outcomes. It's systematically the analysis of the various epistemic and incentives at work combined with the other pathologies of politics makes us, or me at least, I don't want to speak on your behalf, conclude that systematically we're not going to get good results. It's what I call a pattern prediction. Anytime you spend money on stuff, some good stuff's going to come out of it. That shouldn't strike you as, as crazy, right? That's just the logic of it. Very quickly, the public good problem, which is the classic for economists. Defense is a public good. It's non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Therefore, private people can't provide it. Well, maybe, except that poses a problem, which is this. Let's pretend it is a public good for a moment. Who's providing it? The state. Well, the state is a public good. A constitutionally constrained state that acts in the public interest is non-excludable and non-rivalrous. Because in the area where it has its geographic monopoly on force, you can exclude non-payers. And provide the, the state doing good stuff to one person doesn't preclude it doing good stuff for other people. So if people can't provide defense, presumably they can't create a state that is one that is representative of their interests because they're incapable of doing so for the same reason. That is, they can't create a state to provide the entire portfolio of supposed public goods, precisely because they can't provide public goods, or so I'm told. So then we have quickly devolved into a situation where you have to make an argument for some form of liberal authoritarianism. That is, I think there should be a, a person or a group of people running the show, and they're going to do good things, perhaps. What other standards? Everyone else is doing it. If we don't do it, China, North Korea will do it. Well, again, you know, the, the, the logic we teach kids goes a long way. Uh, when I was little and said this to my mom, she said, if everyone else was jumping off a bridge, would you? Uh, no, mom, you're right, I can go away, right? Uh, if we don't intervene around the world, China will. Uh, great, uh, good for them. Uh, uh, let them be the illiberal authoritarians. Uh, how does other people acting to be illiberal authoritarians somehow grant us the right to be illiberal authoritarians? But also, why do we want to give up liberalism? Is it that cheap? Is it that easy? We're like, yeah, they're acting very badly, so we should too. We should just give up the game. We should give up everything that, that the liberal project entails because other people have. It seems to be, to be a very weak uh, uh, set of uh, uh, conclusions. Uh, finally, alternatives. Uh, and this is where I'm going to end. What's the alternative? The same alternative we have uh, in other areas of life. I don't know the specifics, but private individuals doing things. How about that? And you say, well, wait, they can't defend themselves. Yes, they can. They defend themselves all the time. Because notice, even if you think they can't defend themselves against external threats, if you believe in a liberal constitutional democracy, you certainly believe they can protect themselves from domestic threats, the main one being the state. 
So what happens? You grant the state power to protect you against external threats. And you say the people will check them so they don't abuse their power. Then the citizens can presumably provide pub uh, private defense. What else? We have a huge amount of empirical evidence across time and space of people coming together to solve collective action problems, absent any kind of formal monopoly on force, to combat both internal and external threats. Some of this falls under the purview of what's called nonviolent action. Others is violent action. But there are numerous historical cases across numerous contexts and, and, and space of people doing this. And there's arguments to be had that this is actually superior to state-provided defense precisely because you avoid all the pitfalls I just talked about. Nonetheless, and irregardless of where you fall down on this question, what I hope I've gotten you to think about is some of the implicit presumptions people have about the role of the state, the role of war making, and most importantly, to hearken back to that insight that Harper made in 1951, but ideas that he had committed to well before that, that the state poses the greatest threat to the core classical liberal values that are at the foundation of this organization. Thank you very much.